for the reading of God's Word from Zechariah chapter 8. You may listen or you may read together with Bible in hand. Zechariah chapter 8 verses 18 to 23. And the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. Thus says the Lord of hosts, People shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days... Ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, I want to remind us that we are in a mini-series within our series of Zechariah. And this mini-series is within the first verse of Zechariah chapter 7 to the last verse of Zechariah chapter 8, which is just a strange way of saying Zechariah chapter 7 and 8. And today's passage is the last part of this three-part series entitled or titled From Fasting to Feasting. And I hope you understand why we've called it that, especially now that we've read this last passage in in Zechariah chapter 8. If you remember, in the beginning of chapter 7, the people had a question about fasting. And all of a sudden here, God finally, after a bit of a detour, a good detour that is, God finally answers their question about fasting and tells them that it will one day turn into feasting. Now, I want to work our way backwards so we get context and we know what this last passage is all about. Go back to Zechariah chapter 8 verses 16 and 17. This was the last two verses we studied two weeks ago. These are the things that you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. And love no false oath, for all these things I hate, declares the Lord. Now in context of chapter, of of connecting it with chapter 7, God was basically calling upon the people to stop being so hypocritical. They had all of these religious questions, but they were engaging in false, hypocritical religion. And now God is saying, look, I've given you a picture of hope. I've given you a picture of a new Jerusalem, a renewed and transformed people where I will dwell in her midst. That's a promise. That's an amazing thing. So therefore, stop being hypocritical now. Stop living in hypocrisy today. Stop asking me about whether or not you should fast when in the first place you were fasting for your own self-centered reasons anyway. So no more lying to each other. You've got to speak the truth because that's what my covenant people are to do. Quit turning a blind eye to the injustices you find in your community and uphold justice. This was the same stuff that God was saying in chapter 7, verses 8 to 10. So, in the first half of chapter 8, we see blessing upon blessing upon blessing promised by God. And it's it's a great turn of events because God said that once upon a time, or even not too long ago, Israel was a byword of cursing among the nations. You look at verse 13. They were a byword of cursing among the nations, yet God says, So I will save you, and you shall be a blessing. Just as God promised Father Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
We know that God keeps His promises, and we know that this promise has been kept in the coming of Christ, who is the descendant, the seed of Abraham, through whom all the nations of the world shall be blessed. Through faith in the seed of Abraham, faith in the offspring, we become Abraham's spiritual offspring, as Galatians 3 says. So in chapter 7, we saw false religion, hypocritical fasting, and remember what we said, I hope we remember this, a false religion is mere ritual without love for God, while true religion is faith working through love. And then in chapter 8, verses 1 to 17, we found out that there is a blessing, the blessing of true religion. And ultimately, the blessing of true religion is Christ. Because the key to understanding what God means in verse 8, go back there, when He says, They shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. The key to understanding how God is going to do that is Jesus. How does God intend to dwell in the midst of His people? Well, He would actually come. And remember John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh, and then He dwelt among us. God came to His people. God came to Jerusalem. Jesus is God with us. He is the anticipated branch of Zechariah. He is the one that would put together the offices of priest and king and would sit on the throne and rule over his people, but at, the, but at the same time be a mediator between God and man. Christ is the blessing to be received by faith. John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's what it's all about. That's eternal life. That's the key. It's knowing Jesus. It's having faith in Him. And now today, chapter 18, verses 18 to 23, God finally gives an answer, finally, to the, answer, to the question which was posed in chapter 7. Should we still keep the fifth month fast, the four, the, w w whichever month it was that they had first mentioned? Um, yes, the fifth month fast. And God finally answers now, I will turn your fasting to feasting. Remember what happened in chapter 7? Verse 2 and 3, here it is. The people of Bethel had sent these men to entreat the favor of the Lord, saying to the priests of the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets, Should I weep and abstain in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? This is their fasting. This was self-imposed fasting. It had to do with weeping, mourning, and abstaining as a sign of humiliation before God. And do you remember God's initial response to their question? He said, was it for me that you fasted? Even me? You know, anybody can fast. Anybody can, let's put it in our modern context, anybody can come to church. Anybody can do morning devotions. Anybody can do this and that. Anybody can be churchy. But God asked these people, was it for me that you fasted? And remember, He asks us a very similar question. Is it for me that you are publicly praying? Is it for me that you are doing this, this practice every morning, spending time in the Word? Is it a checkbox? Is it mere religiosity or false religion where there is no love for God, where it's not generated out of a gratitude for God? It's a serious question. It's something you and I will always be struggling with in our imperfect state. There is a cognitive dissonance between our hearts, our minds, and our actions. Sometimes they just don't relate. And Christianity is not fake it till you make it. Just do the steps. Just do the stuff until it becomes real. No, no, that is dangerous. So that's why God questions these guys. Was it even for me that you fasted? Now, as a refresher, they had four self-imposed fasts. God never condemned these fasts in and of themselves because fasting indeed was an appropriate response 
when God's impending judgment is before us and we are seeking God's help, we are seeking God's wisdom, we are seeking His will, and we're just longing for God. It's an appropriate response, it really is. So these guys had four fasts, and it was all related to the destruction of Jerusalem. And they kept these four fasts throughout the 70-year exile, right? As a sign of their mourning and affliction. They did the ninth day of the fourth month, which commemorated the day that the city walls were breached by the enemies. They kept the 18th day of the fifth month, which was the one that they mentioned in Zechariah 7, and that was a horrible day. It commemorated the burning of the city and the temple. They also kept the third day of the seventh month, which was the commemoration of the murder, the murder of their governor, Gedaliah. And the tenth day of the tenth month, which was the day that Nebuchadnezzar had surrounded the city. And you notice how they asked simply, should we still fast the fifth month? God advances it by saying, when you fasted and mourned the fifth month and the seventh, God knows about these fasts. Was it for me that you fasted? So finally, after announcing the coming prosperity of Zion, a new Jerusalem, peace and transformation, God finally answers that initial question back in chapter 7 about fasting. So what I'd like us to do is understand God's answer. It's a little bit more complex than you think. It's not a simple yes or no, should we fast, yes or no. So we'll, an we'll answer, we'll try to understand his answer. And then, for the remainder of our time, I want us to ask our own question. Should we fast or should we feast today as Christians? Should we fast or should we feast? So here's the first thing. God's answer is this. God will turn our fasting into feasting. This is the answer they were waiting for, and it wasn't really the answer that they expected. Verse 18, And the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, look how God advances it. Now He names all four. The fast of the fourth month, the fifth month, the seventh month, the tenth month, shall be to the house of Judah seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love, truth, and feast, and peace. No, no, you love that too, but yeah, notice the flow. God criticized the people for their false religion. He nevertheless encourages the people by promising transformation in the land. And now he goes back to their question about fasting and basically says, here's how I'm going to answer you. It's not a simple yes or no. This is, see, we're talking about a living relationship between God and His covenant people. When it comes to religious practices, oftentimes it's not as simple as yes or no. There's a wisdom issue here. There's a deeper issue here. You've got a heart problem. And yes, you do have reason to fast and mourn because I have clearly judged you. I have done these things because of your sin. But on the other hand, I want you to know, and here's the graciousness of God, I will one day turn your fasting into feasting. A day is coming when fasting and mourning and humiliation and affliction will no longer be necessary. A day is coming when mourning will be no more. They asked about the fifth month fast. God said that both their fifth and seventh month fasts were self-centered, not pleasing to Him. But now He says, all the fasts, fourth, fifth, seventh, tenth month fasts, all of these will one day become feasts. I don't know if you feel this, but there's a huge contrast between fasting and feasting. I don't know about you. Have you tried it? Huge contrast. Many of you have fasted. Compare that to feasting. Huge difference. God is using this as sort of an object lesson to the great turn of events that is going to happen when His branch comes. God is using this as a stark contrast between where they've been to where they will be going. Think about fasting. If you don't know what fasting is, it is beseeching God and longing for God while taking away 
food and sometimes even drink and things of the like, which is basically an expression which says that I desire and need God more than anything else that sustains me on earth. People usually do it when they're seeking God's will, when they're asking for His help, when they're trying to overcome great things which they know they cannot overcome themselves and they seek strength from God. It sounds great and spiritual. The truth is, you get very hungry, don't you? <laughs> you get drained, you get hungry. I'm not talking about a one day. I'm not talking about intermittent fasting. I'm talking about these fasts that people in Bible times would do and Christians today should engage in, which lasts several days. You basically feel like you're starving. You feel dried up, hungry, thirsty. You begin to feel that there's some kind of lack of nourishment and strength. And I kid you not, if you do it for three or four days or anything longer than that, weird things start happening to your brain. Right? And that, that's, that's true. Contrast that, for those of you who have fasted, to when you break your fast. You fast for like a week. And then you break your, you know, you know that's where the word breakfast comes from, right? It's a break fast. You come together maybe with your church, maybe with your family. It's been days and you have a meal together and you know, people advise you, you know, you should start with soup or something so your stomach can expand. But most people, they feast. I'm not saying it's necessarily the healthiest thing to just gorge yourself all of a sudden, but most people, they feast. They feast in light of the fact that previously they've been fasting. And now it's time to feast. Huge contrast. And now take that into the spiritual realities of what God is trying to say to Judah. Uh, you've gone from mourning, we'll go to dancing. You've gone from fasting, we'll go to feasting. You've gone from lamenting, we'll go to rejoicing. I'll turn your sadness into gladness. That's what God is doing here. Therefore, don't just ask, should we fast? Since you've already promised that the temple will be rebuilt and the land will be renewed and the people will be okay. Since the promise is already there, I trust you. Should we still fast? You're asking the wrong question. Whether you do or you don't, in light of what I'm about to do, that I'm turning your fasting into feasting, God says in the end of verse 19, therefore, love truth and peace. If we understand what God is doing, if we know that He is a redeeming God and He's got this great plan, then it's not all the, 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 the question is never, or the question isn't always, should I or should I not when it comes to something such as a spiritual practice of fasting. But the way that God is answering here is whether you do or you don't, there are times that you should. There are times that you don't need to. Th these things are, are happening in the Christian life, but whether you do or you don't, Live in light of what God has done and is doing. Love, truth, and peace, says the Lord. If you really understand what God is doing, if you really trust in His plans, if you believe that He is your Redeemer, and then whatever religious practices you participate in, you must do so truthfully, sincerely, and out of love for God. Because you can't lie to Him. Is that what we're doing today? I'm not talking about a vague generalization. I mean today, right now, in church, this moment, you're all here. We're all going to do the Christian stuff. I know we've already addressed this, but I, I feel like it needs to be addressed again in light of this passage. We, we do these things. We want to honor the Lord. We want to keep we want to keep His commandments. We want to honor the Lord's day in public and private worship in our camp. You know, I understand Troy gave a really good workshop on family worship. And maybe a lot of people are going, yeah, well, we got to do this better. We got to do that. Why? But, but why? Oh, there's a biblical precedent and a biblical command. Absolutely. Amen. I agree. It's biblical. But why are you doing it? Why, why do you, maybe for some of you who have not been doing certain practices before, before you started to come um, and, and, and hear about these things, why do you now want to do these practices? Oh, you, you weren't into the fourth commandment and, you know, the idea of, of uh, the Lord's Day Sabbath before. Okay, and now you've learned about it. You heard it from our doctrine class. Other people are into it. Now you're into it. Why? 
What is it? Where is it coming from? Are you seeing the grace of God in it and therefore you want to participate in it? Are you seeing the blessing of God pouring out from heaven in your family when you surround yourself, when you gather around the word and you pray and you sing? Is that why? Or is it because, well, you know, this, this church is, they're all doing it. I don't want to be left out. I don't want to be weird. You know, all of these people are gung-ho about all of these things. What are we doing and why are we doing it? If the people really believed in their day that God was ensuring the rebuilding of the temple, the restoration of the city, and He was ensuring it, then therefore they would be at peace among each other even when things aren't there yet because God has guaranteed ultimate peace. For example, with the issue of Christian unity, a lot of people like to say, well, you know, that's it. We have denominations, it's a necessary evil. I do agree, we have it, it is a necessary evil. Yes, absolutely true. And they go, and perfect unity isn't going to be achieved now, it's only going to be achieved in the new creation. Well, yeah, that is true. And if you believe that it is the ultimate purpose of God in the new creation, we must cultivate it today. In every way that we can, in good conscience, we must cultivate Christian unity even today. Just as God said to the people back then, well, the temple's not yet rebuilt, the cataclysmic event hasn't taken place yet, the branch hasn't come, but He is. It's certain. I've promised it. So in light of that future reality, live it out now. Truth, peace among the brethren, is that how we are living today? We cultivate peace among the saints in light of the perfect peace we will experience in the New Jerusalem. Are you seeing it? You're saying, I can't really see it. Make it seen in the church. You know, people like to say that when we gather for worship and there is edification, this is the closest glimpse that we can ever catch of heaven itself. Yes, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May that future perfect reality be a driving motivation for us to cultivate this kind of truth and peace among saints today. For those in the post-exilic community after exile, God's message is clear. I'm, I, I don't need to repeat myself. I've given you so many visions, but you know what? I like repeating it because it's so good, says the Lord. A new era of redemption is dawning. A time that would not be marked by fasting, but by feasting. There will be no more exile when this time comes, no more judgment when this time comes, no more tears, there will only be celebration and joy. And you see, this is why I love reading both the Old and the New Testament and helping help so that we can help understand each because a lot of times you read Old Testament prophecy and it flattens out the first and second coming of Christ, doesn't it? On purpose, on purpose, because this is an unveiling mystery. God doesn't just, just drop it on you in one book of the Bible. What would happen to your brain? if God dropped the entire plan of redemption, including first coming, second coming, and everything, in just one book of like three chapters. No, He gave us 66 books to try to even understand the unfolding of redemptive history. So a lot of times you read Old Testament prophecy and you go, well, the second coming, first coming, was well, kind of like both, and that's where we get to this whole already but not yet, but it's a beautiful mystery. It really is. Do you desire to participate? in this new era of redemption, which God has announced to these people. Well, I've got really good news for you. The promise was not limited to the post-exilic community in Judah. Look at verse 20. Thus says the Lord of hosts, People shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. Not just locals, not just Judahites, not just Israelites but people from many cities. When God does His thing in Jerusalem, He will draw the nations in like a powerful magnet. You know, a lot of the previous eight night visions are kind of being recapitulated, if you will, or repeated here, and it will continue to happen. God is drawing the nations in, and isn't it how great? I just love things like this. 
how in chapter 7 we began with a small group from Bethel asking a question about fasting, and they got more than they bargained for <laughs> with the way that God adds. We were just asking whether or not we should fast. Now you've got this whole entire cataclysmic event that's going to take place and this new era of dawning. And wow, and this stuff, God is saying, isn't just for you guys. I'm talking about drawing people from all over. Look at verse 22. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. So look at the literary beauty of the Bible. In chapter 7, verse 2, the people of Bethel sent their men, a few people, just a small delegation, to entreat the favor of the Lord. And at the end of chapter 8, here in verse 22, the nation shall come to entreat the favor of the Lord. Same words. Do you see the literary connection? It's beautiful. Small group from Bethel, should we fast? They came to entreat the favor of the Lord. God, way more than they bargained for in the way that God answered. And it ends by saying, people from all nations will come to entreat the favor of the Lord. One thing I learned from that is God is really good at storytelling. He really is. He's a genius. From a small group of men to multitudes of many nations entreating the Lord. Many shall enter the holy city of God. And these people are even encouraging each other. Look at verse 21. They're saying, hey, uh, let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. Come to the city where fasting is turned into feasting. Come see your mourning turn into dancing. Now before we look at the last verse, in verse 23, I want us now to ask our own question. Here's our second point. Should we fast or should we feast? In a big way, the cataclysmic event that God is talking about in sending a branch has taken place in a big way. So, should it all just be feasting now? Oh, but wait a minute, Jesus doesn't teach against fasting. He actually commends fasting during this era of redemptive history. So, what is this era marked by? Mourning or dancing? Should we fast or should we feast? How can we apply what we're reading here? Let's try to get from their world into our world. From Jerusalem in 518 BC to Mount Waverly Bowls Club, 2021 AD. It's a long time. These people, let's go to their world first. They're right smack in the middle of the temple rebuilding. It's been two years since they've started, and our estimations say it's going to be two years till they finish. But as we know, it wasn't as simple as, oh, so rebuild the temple, God will return, His presence will dwell with us. All right, therefore, after two years, the temple's done, New Jerusalem. Well, it's been a really long time. We're not really there yet, are we? Temple's done. Nevertheless, it was a huge step forward in God's plan. You know, sometimes we get bothered by that. Christ is coming soon. It's, like, well, it's been 2,000 years, you know? What do you mean by soon? What do you mean? It, it, it's, it's, it's coming. What do you mean it's coming? And God's years, um, you know, in, in God's eyes, there's no, oh, this is taking forever. Nothing takes forever for God, all right? He is eternal. Mm. Nevertheless, even though it's going to be a long time before the fullness of these promises come, the rebuilding of the temple for the Jews was a huge step forward in God's plan. These were good signs. Okay, understand this. The people returned. The temple began to function again. The future looked bright. But it was hundreds of years before God arrived. Literally, God arrived as promised. And when Jesus came... God in the flesh, when He came to Jerusalem, it's no surprise that there were people who had some questions about fasting all over again. Religious people. In the time of Jesus, the Pharisees were keen to fast. Luke 18, 11, The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, you know this one, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week 
I give tithes of all that I get. The, the Pharisees at this point in time were fasting well beyond those of Judah after the exile were. But what we read there is explicit, hypocritical fasting. I'm glad I'm not like them. I fast twice a week. These guys need an exposition of Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 8. Now, there's some other people that were into fasting that weren't doing it wrong necessarily. John the Baptist and his disciples. You think about John the Baptist and you think he would really fit in that old covenant era of mourning and weeping and preaching repentance and all of those things. And that's true because John the Baptist is, as we know, the last of the old covenant prophets. He was the last one who came before Jesus died and resurrected to prophesy on behalf of God. He was predicted by the prophets of the Old Testament as well. And his disciples and him were big on fasting. Luke 5, 33. And they said to him, to Jesus, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours, you Jesus, you and your guys, what are you guys doing? You eat and drink. So there's that question. Christians, should we fast or should we feast? In that specific story in Luke chapter 5, they seem to be feasting. That's what eating and drinking communicates. They seem to be happy. They're feasting. And here's John the Baptist, who's an old covenant prophet, who was himself big on fasting because his ministry was a ministry of preaching repentance. I'm not saying ours is not, but that was his emphasis. It was preaching repentance, it was mourning over sin, and it was anticipating the Messiah. Right there is a big difference between Judah's situation in Zechariah and our situation today. We're still anticipating things. Of course we are. But they were anticipating the Messiah's coming, His first coming, while you and I are living in a time where He has already come. You need to understand the huge cultural difference here. You do not know a time. You've never lived in a time when the Messiah had not arrived on earth. You don't know what that's like. You don't know what a world is like without Christianity. And of course, there are some remote places out there that are unreached by Christianity and we're doing missions to them. But I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about you. You don't know a world without Judeo-Christianity, without that kind of worldview and foundation. You don't know what it's like to anticipate the first coming of the Messiah, that He would be crucified. It's all past for you. All preaching you've ever heard, all Bible verses you've ever read, were all in light of the fact that Christ has come. Richard Phillips in his commentary on Zechariah writes, the Bible commends fasting as a means of spiritual preparation for the blessings we anticipate from God. We are seeing a renewed emphasis on fasting today, but much of it reflects the attitude of the delegation from Bethel, which was rebuked for its external reliance on methods. Some people today likewise treat fasting as a little more than a way to get what they want from God. True fasting is meant not for our own benefit, but for God's, as an expression of a broken heart for sin or of mourning for the sorrow and suffering in this world. This is what dominated John the Baptist's ministry. That's why it was very appropriate that him and disciples, his disciples were big on fasting. Because their ministry was mourning for sin and sin's misery out of devotion to God. Close quote. So it makes sense why they were fasting. And Jesus came, get this, to take away one of the primary reasons for fasting, mourning our own sin and God's impending judgment. This is the true Christian experience, Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be, what? Comforted. That's almost like what we're seeing, the shift from fasting to feasting. 
Jesus says in Luke chapter 5, verse 34, Can you make wedding guests fast or mourn while the bridegroom is with them? That was Jesus' answers when the Pharisees asked, Why, What are you guys doing? Why are you eating and drinking? And Jesus just straight up looks at them and says, Okay, when have you ever been in a wedding where the celebrants were there, the, the, the bridegroom is there, and the people fasted. It's not a time for fasting. The bridegroom is here. It's time to eat. It's time to drink. It's time to celebrate because this is an amazing event. I have come. Can you make wedding feast, wedding guests fast and mourn while the bridegroom is with them? And isn't going from mourning to comfort, like the Beatitude says, sort of like our conversion experience? Don't we also have a sort of John the Baptist kind of emphasis when we come to Christ? This kind of deep set concern of guilt, fear of God's wrath. We come under conviction. We are in mourning mode. Haven't you had this real life experience? Maybe not even in the day of your conversion, but when you have fallen to grave sin, Maybe some of you have fallen into grave sins. Maybe you have fallen back into a pattern of sin. And maybe this is a time that it actually makes sense to be in mourning mode, yet you are shrugging it off. Our experience should be like the psalmist in Psalm 32, when we are in sin, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long, day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. It's as if God has this gigantic hand weighing on you because of your sin. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. But blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That same psalmist in Psalm 32 is also able to say, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. There is a a fasting to feasting experience for the believer right there. Now let's go back to what Jesus was saying about fasting. Because the disciples were in the very presence of Christ, there was, at that very moment, absolutely no reason to fast. Because think about it. One of the reasons to fast is to draw near to God, right? Well, there's God. There He is. (laughs) He's right there. Don't go away and fast. Commune with Him. Rejoice with Him. Feast with Him. There was God. There He was. What more could you ask for? What more could you be longing for when you are in the presence of Messiah? What more? Why would you make wedding guests fast and mourn when the bridegroom has arrived? So in the coming of Jesus, that cataclysmic event has come. Something has changed. In the new era of redemption, which Zechariah anticipated, had come in a large way. In Luke 5, 35, the days will come, says Jesus, when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. So this helps us answer the question, should we fast or should we feast? He was physically there. Makes no sense to fast. But then he says, a day is coming when the bridegroom is going to be taken away. And then it will be appropriate for them to once again fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine skin into old wine, new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. Jesus our Lord is making an old covenant, new covenant contrast here. Fasting is a good thing. It's something that true believers can engage in. But Jesus is saying that we should not go back to old covenant ways. We should not go back to imposing like they did those fastings upon themselves in light of the exile that they experienced in the siege of Jerusalem. Messiah has come. So we are not, as Christians, as Christians now, 
fasting John the Baptist style. We are not fasting fear of God's impending judgment style. We fast in a new way. We fast in light of the fact that the Messiah has already come. Yes, we anticipate, but we have Him now. Yet He has been ascended. He has ascended and He is away. And there's, that's why it still makes sense for a Christian every now and then. Remember when we talked about the elements of worship and this is a occasional element of worship? There will be times of sorrow in the Christian life. There will be times of mourning. There will be times when God does, He's not far, but He may feel far. And you will want to long for Him and draw near to Him and fasting would be appropriate. But the old ways are no longer appropriate for this new era because a better era has come. To put it another way, Mount Waverly Bowls Club in 2021, don't pretend you are in Judah in 518 BC because you're not. The four fasts mentioned in Zechariah 7 to 8 were responses to God's frightening acts of judgment. Now, He still judges the world in many ways, but now the Deliverer has come. What judgment of God have you to fear? It's been lifted. It's been born on the cross. The Deliverer has come, and He has come to take God's judgment on behalf of God's people. So that's why we fast in a different way, in a new way. And Jesus does say that day came, and that day did come where the bridegroom was taken away, and they shall fast. Christ was crucified, Christ died, Christ rose again, all of that's good news. But Christ also ascended to heaven, and now we're waiting for Him to return. So in this already but not yet era of redemption, fasting still has its place. We should be candid in talking about this as a church and encouraging each other. And, you know, we don't have it all figured out, but trying to understand together, how can we properly ap appropriate this thing into our Christian life? If we don't know, let's ask. Christ bore our sins but we await glory, we await perfection and eternity in heaven. We still sin. And although the judgment of God has been lifted, He still disciplines us. And therefore, often, fasting is an appropriate response to what's going on in life as we await the second coming. So there is fasting. But on the other hand, we also feast. And believe it or not, I know it's hard to picture, because a lot of times the Lord's Supper is celebrated with teeny bitty little things. <laughs> but eating and drinking was a feast. The Lord's Supper was seen as the new feast. Remember back in Zechariah 8, 8, when God promised, they shall be my people and I will be their God. Do, do you remember we looked at Ezekiel and we looked at Jeremiah and we saw what those words are talking about? It's talking about the new covenant. They will be my people. I will be their God, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel, and so on. And when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, what does He say? This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Just like what we heard last week brings us back to the cross. It brings us back to the cross of Jesus Christ as that thing that accomplishment, that way of God bringing about a new redemptive era in history where the kingdom has arrived in Jesus, the new era has dawned in Jesus, the promises of God are being fulfilled in this simple feast where Jesus takes the cup and says, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. I died for you. I purchased you. This simple feast we call the Lord's Supper is something we are commanded to actually keep doing in preparation of the final, most joyful, climactic feast when we meet Jesus face to face. Jesus' words are, I tell you, 
I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Christ has come, yet we await His return. But in light of the fact that Christ has come, we feast. This era of redemptive history is marked by rejoicing, dancing, and feasting because we are, to put it in a simple way, we're saved. We're saved. We are saved people. We're born again, saved, justified, accepted by God people. So we've made our way from Judah in 518 BC to the first century when Jesus arrived and now to Mount Waverly Bulls Club in 2021 AD. So should we fast or should we feast? Yes, is the answer. Should we fast or should we feast? Yes, both. We fast because we are anticipating. There are many things in God's plan that have not yet come. In fact, I I really hope they come soon. We're anticipating great things. Zechariah anticipated the first coming. You and I anticipate the second coming. Our hearts will f- are filled with longing. So let me ask you, I know we've emphasized how, oh, don't pretend you're in 518 BC. We're living in a better time. Christ has already come. Absolutely. I agree. That's, that's great. But are you longing for the second coming? Are you longing for all things to be made right in the city of God? Are you longing to see Jesus face to face? That's why sometimes we fast, but in a greater sense, we feast. Because we are living in the day of fulfillment. Finally, that last verse in Zechariah 8.23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Ten foreigners taking hold of the hem of one Jew, this vivid image of God's plan to, in a large way, graft in the nations, graft in the Gentiles. And isn't that what we begin to see when Christ came? Gentiles, He began with the Jews, to the Jew first. And then He starts expanding. And in a sense, think about it this way, Gentiles begin grabbing on to Israel, grabbing on to God's people, becoming a part of God's people. Ten men from the nations of every language, the the day of Pentecost was just the beginning. It was just the beginning when people from many languages are hearing the gospel. It's ongoing even today. It's spreading all over the globe. Salvation is now going to every language and every people group on earth. And all of it began with the Jews, just like this verse says. And Jesus commissioned His disciples to preach the gospel first in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Zechariah was not only anticipating God coming to Jerusalem, and he did, and he will, but through that coming, Zechariah was also anticipating the universal expansion of God's kingdom over all the earth. The nations will come, says the Lord. And we must not lose this history. We must not lose the Jewish history, the Jewishness of the Christian faith. We must not forget that we have a Jewish Messiah and that the only way anyone shall know the Lord, whether male or female, slave or free, Jew or Greek, is by clinging on to the robe of His righteousness. That's how we get in. Because we've only got one God and one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. We've only got one name under heaven or earth by which man must be saved, Jesus Christ. He is God with us. Grab on to His robe. Trust in Him. Cling on to the one Jew who is our Messiah. And as you hang on to Him, fast as you long to see Him face to face. But even more so, feast, because in Him we are cleansed transformed, and this kingdom is ours. 
the kingdom of God which spans all creation which we, He will fully renew and transform and perfect is ours in Christ. Our Father, our Shepherd, our King, who delights to give us the kingdom, who takes great pleasure in giving us the kingdom. We thank you, Lord, that in the gospel there is no distinction. We all must come to the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. There is only one door. There is only one narrow path. We thank you, Lord, for leading, our, leading us into that door, through that path, and into your kingdom. Lord, as we anticipate the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, please, that you would create a deep longing in us. That even though we're born again, even though we're saved, even though we have fellowship with you, create in us this, 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 this concern that we're not there yet. And we want to get there. We so want to meet Christ in the flesh. But Lord, may we not get comfortable in this world. May we not get so used to living in this world because we're not in, we're not in the new creation yet. May there be a clear distinction between us, your kingdom, and the kingdoms of men. And we pray, Lord, that our life here on earth, before Jesus returns, would involve both fasting and feasting in an appropriate new covenant manner in light of the fact that Christ has come and is coming. Help our church as well, Lord, to really appreciate what it means to live in this new covenant era, in this new age, after this cataclysmic event of Christ's coming has already taken place, may we not be so blind to the privilege that we have in living in this side of the Bible. May we make the most out of it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.